I'm Shana Weber, and this is the Emerging Screenwriters Interview Series. In this episode, you are going to meet Seth Michael Donsky. Seth is a screenwriter who's writing stories about people outside of the mainstream. He is on our ISA development slate after being selected for our 2023 diversity initiative for his script, Grit and Glitter. Seth is an emerging screenwriter, but he's not a newbie. He's been around for quite a while. He is doing great things. He has a lot of projects that are right on the verge of popping. I feel like you're gonna hear his name a lot in the future. So this is a good interview to watch. He did wanna mention that he left someone off of his list of people he admires, his heroes in the industry, and that is Dustin Lance Black. So I wanted to make sure that we got that in there and I hope you enjoy his interview. Hi, Seth. Hello, Shana. How are you? Happy to be here. I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Perfect. Um, so this is an interview series all about you. We're talking about how you started writing, what your process is, who you admire. So let's start there. Let's start with an easy thing. What are you watching now? Who are your heroes in the film TV world? Well, like everybody else, I'm watching Oppenheimer and just in complete awe of how Chris Nolan can do anything like that and keep all of that in mind. Uh, and Chris Nolan is certainly one of my heroes. I would say Ken Lonergan is a big hero of mine because I really like simple human stories that have really deep emotional resonance and don't need uh, sort of the opposite of, of the complex sort of plots that Christopher Nolan puts together. Don't use that kind of um, complex plotting, but really have deep, uh, searing emotional portraits of people. So Ken Lonergan, I've always been influenced by Derek Jarman when I first came in. Um, I would say that's what got me interested in wanting to work at film at all was discovering uh, who Derek Jarman was if someone isn't, you know, doesn't know those names. Oh, they're okay. like things that they can look up. Yes, yeah, so Derek Jarman was a um, out gay filmmaker um, who passed away from AIDS actually in the late 80s, I would say, but was really prolific up until he passed away uh, and was a person who discovered Tilda Swinton actually and got her career going. But because I'm most interested in in writing around the identity issues. So I gravitate towards people who have accomplished in that arena like Todd Haynes um, and Tom Kalen and uh, some of the other, uh, you know, queer auteurs, uh, certainly Barry Jenkins, of yes. course, okay. uh, Barry Jenkins. So it was interesting the year that um, Moonlight went up against um, Ken Lonergan's uh, picture about the guy who burnt his family down. Oh, oh my God, what was that one called? Manchester. Oh, right, right, right. <clears throat> yeah. Yes, because two of my favorite filmmakers and authors were up against each other for um, best picture. And the awards landed sort of exactly as I would have called them. Um, uh, Barry Jenkins got best picture for the innovation that was so amazing in his storytelling of Moonlight, but Ken Lonergan got best screenplay because I think people recognized how really difficult it was to write those scenes. Ken Lonergan finds words for situations we are all in and do not have the words for. And you watch it and just go, you know, um, Michelle Williams has the scene where she runs into um, Casey Affleck and they haven't spoken to each other at all since he burned the house down and killed their family. And you would, what, what on earth do you say in that situation? And it's just such a powerful, powerful scene. So I'm always trying to live up. That's, I think I would hold up that scene as one of the scenes I try to live up to in my writing all the time. Um, and Kaufman, Charlie Kaufman, okay. of course. Cause that's just, anything that can pull me out of critical thinking while I'm watching it is like, 
hugely accomplished. I can't get over his creativity. Sure, that's a good point. Okay. Um, so now that we've talked about these sort of iconic people, let's talk about, and, and that kind of sounds like a dig, but it's absolutely not. I'm shifting to you, which, and iconic in your own way, <laughs> just not at that level yet. Yeah, no, I totally get it. Let's talk about you and you've kind of given a little bit of info about the kinds of stories that you like based on who you are reading and watching. But tell me about your journey in into screenwriting and uh, where did that begin? Began in high school with acting and it began with seeing Harold and Maud and never having seen anything like that in my life. And I decided um, I was gonna be an actor. Okay. And I went into that, I went into, I, I went to UC Irvine um, for uh, theater and didn't get cast in like anything. <laughs> so I was like, oh man. Uh, and I started directing. Um, so, uh, I was like the youngest person to direct a, a full main stage production at any of the UC campuses at the time. I just directed a lot. Uh, and then I went to New York after school and I started writing my own sort of little plays and directing, um, other classics that I had just always been interested in. And, um, I got really frustrated by the ethereal nature of it. And like, if you weren't getting reviewed, which like I was not getting reviewed, you might as well have not done it. You know, it was very hard to communicate what I could do. And so completely ignorantly, I thought, well, I'll just make a film. Hmm. And I jumped in and this was actually sort of the, the very end of the nineties. So this is when no one was making films on their phones. I mean, such a thing didn't exist. And so we were using 35 millimeter and cutting on a steam back and like negative matching and like all this stuff that people wouldn't even know what it was. Um, and I had written the script, but I got a lot of support based on the quality of the script, which really blew my mind at the time that I was able to sort of put it, uh, enough financing together to shoot it. And we got some really um, interesting people in it. Uh, Bill Hickey was in it. It was Billy Porter's first like film role. Um, and I just got hooked by the film bug then and started watching everything I could. And that's when I decided, no, I really want to be um, a film writer. And uh, yeah, that's that that was the journey, basically. Were there stories that you felt like needed to be told that weren't being told? Like what what drove you into why? Yes. So when I was working, began doing this, it was sort of at the end of what was called the new queer cinema, which uh, Todd Haynes and Greg Araki and um, um, uh, Sue Friedrich and uh, Cheryl Dunier, we're getting out very um, politically driven queer material. And I thought that there was a need for less politically minded work at the time that struck a more um, uh, common humanity in the queer experience. Um, and it didn't have to be overloaded with sexual images and might therefore, um, I didn't wanna, uh, I, I don't mean to, to put, cause I admire those people so much. I didn't wanna preach to the choir. And I was like, can I get a story like this told to a wider audience and break away from that? So I think that's where it really began was talking about the queer experience and wanting to do it in a way that was relatable as possible. I love that. Those were the stories I, I initially gravitated to. And in many ways, it's still sort of where, where I gravitate, you know? And when you're creating, like, let's say you're sitting, you want to create a new film or a new script. Do, where do you start? Do you start with character? Do you start with like a plot? Where do you, or is it different for each project? It's different for each project. Um, one of the projects I did came from watching the documentary 
uh, Life After the Plague, or it was the it was the AIDS documentary that was nominated for an Oscar. I don't remember if it won or not. And I had also been a kid who grew up. Um, I was like such a geek, such a theater geek, and I was so like closeted in this conservative town. And um, I, I just I had always turned to La Caja Faux. The musical before I even knew what it was a film later I would discover it was much more of a thing um and when I was watching the documentary I thought that's so funny because this is exactly when Lacage was traveling across the country selling theaters out at the height of this plague when everyone was scared of gay people so how did that happen mm. so that was that way in um the film I have right now that uh Bruce Cohen is producing began uh, by just talking to Bruce about all sorts of people and subjects I was interested in. I tend also to be interested in people uh, who weren't recognized in their lifetimes for what it was they'd achieved or were able to achieve. And I gave him a list. I think I must have listed about 10 things. And um, the first person I talked about was Candy Darling. Mm. And he said, I think I'd really like to explore that. And I said, well, should I say the other nine? And he said, don't you want to quit while you're ahead? But I did say the other nine. And so that one came from just talking to Bruce about what we were mutually interested in. Uh, one script that I have now is an adaptation of a the memoir of a huge celebrated pioneer in transgender activism who's also escaped from Scientology. So uh, she's like a twofer in her story, but she is actually the life partner of my mentor since I was like 20 years old. Um, and she never really wanted the, the book to be explored cinematically because it was too difficult for her to revisit all of that stuff. And I went to my mentor at that time. So the, the, the pioneer's name is Kate Bornstein and her partner is named Barbara Corellis. And I went to Barbara and um, Barbara had me talk with Kate. And then, you know, when I could say, well, you know, we were both fat Jewish boys at our bar mitzvahs. So I have some sense of where your story came from. <laughs> she was uh, very um, open to it. Um, Another one I'm working is a novel mm -hmm. that I really love that had actually been initially initially optioned by um, uh, anonymous content for Lynn Shelton. Mm -hmm. And then when Lynn passed away, they let it go into turnaround. And I was like, well, I'm just going to ask. And um, the literary people were very guarded of it, but met with me and then were willing to give me the rights. Uh, and then another piece I'm working on now just came from the uh, an idea. I've sort of always loved horror comedy. And um, I had it my, in my life at some time, like a lot of resentment that held me back that um, I had to deal with. And so I, I could sort of see all of that resentment as sort of being like a, a werewolf kind of a curse, you know, and how much you might um, in, enjoy diving into like your worst instincts. Uh, and then it was just sort of a play on words. It was, I think, well, what would I want to do about a werewolf? And um, I was led to the idea of like a time loop because I was thinking wolf and loop and loopy and like crazy and then time loopy, and I also sort of like time loop. So it's like, oh, that would be, what if like someone was trapped as a werewolf in a time loop and like found themselves losing their humanity more and more every time they got into the loop, you know, and had to figure out some way to break it and, and get back to living without giving into like all of that anger. So that's where that one came from. Um, another that? idea that I haven't worked on yet, but it's on my short list. Uh, came from having been born in Chicago and always been interested in like the political scene of Chicago. It's always sort of been a hot mess. And I was thinking hot mess. And then I was thinking, oh, that fire. I don't know that anyone's ever really done a great um, action piece about that fire that burnt down Chicago. So I thought that would be, that's interesting to me 
two, a kind of like backdraft meets Gangs of New York. So cheap. So real, real low budget movie, that one. That one is not. Yeah, okay. most of mine are low budget. I think that's probably why I haven't really spent a lot of time on that one because I was like, ah, I don't know about this. And I was super lucky when um, the ISA picked uh, one of the, the only sort of huge big budget script I, I wrote for the diversity initiative oh. uh, because I did think, well, this is like, this is expensive. Right. Um, but I didn't let it stop me writing it because it's what I wanted to write at the time. I think that's good that you're- Yeah, so they come from all kinds of places, parts of history I've been interested in, my own life, where things intersect. I like to sort of free write about things and see what I come up with as I go until something says like, okay, yeah, that sounds like a story. Awesome. And how long does it usually take you when you're writing a screenplay to write that first draft? Are you somebody who like vomit drafts or are you very meticulous as you go and kind of edit as you go? I've done both. Yeah. And what I've determined is I would rather vomit draft because I can get stuck in a sand trap yeah. that I can never get out of. So that's my process now. I would say um, before we adopted a kid, maybe two months to get a first draft done. Now I would say it's like between three and four months. I'd start being suspicious if after three and a half or four months, nothing was coming together. Like, okay, maybe there is nothing here. Um, but then the rewriting can take a longer amount of time, like six months maybe to revise, but I'm like a huge perfectionist. Yeah. And I really believe you've got, it's got to leave your hands as perfect as you think it is. If there's anything that's haunting you about it, yeah. deal with it. And how do you, when you have that version or that draft that you feel like is, is like, you're like, I feel like it's good. Do you do table reads? Do you send it? Who do you send to? Do you have your core group of people or are you like, what's, what's that phase like? I have a very core group of people who I trade material with. I'd say there are four of them um, because I'm very hesitant to put something out in a larger sense until I'm really confident in it. So I know these people. What's great about them is they're very honest yeah. and I can be honest with them. So they can they don't waste time trying to blow smoke up my ass. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I know I can sort of trust what they're saying. I don't always agree with it. Sure. By the way. You know they're telling you thoughtful notes. So yeah. that's important too. I do notice if let's say all of them say the same thing, even yeah. if I disagree with it, I think, you know what, they're probably right. But if it's like a one-on-one -on -one disagreement, I'll usually sort of default to me. But I do like thinking about those things. And I just have a tremendous ability to get rid of stuff that isn't working. Oh, good. And rewrite. And I forget who told me this, but I think they were quoting someone else, but it always stuck with me. The great thing about fiction writing is no one's stopping you from making it better. Hmm. Wow. It's true, except yourself, yeah. you know? Yeah. <laughs> and one thing I love doing in rewriting is to decide like what the most challenging thing to do is to make something better and then do it. So sometimes that means getting rid of eight scenes mm. or moving something from act 2B to act 2A because it would be better there, even though I have no idea what's gonna go into act 2B in its place, but instead of worrying about it, just like jump in, move it, put it where it belongs, and then deal with you know the empty spot over there. So I become incredibly good at doing that. Yeah. I yeah. wasn't in the beginning. Isn't it completely freeing and amazing when you cut things that you don't want to, but you you know you need to, and then it just opens up this whole other sort of aspect that you're like, whoa. 
Yeah, you can be led to all kinds of different revelations about it. And I think it takes a kind of faith in yourself. And I don't mean this from like this conceited place, but you can't do it if you're afraid you won't be able to do it. So I always go into it thinking, all right, I can do this. Now, sometimes I can't. Then I've got to rethink it again. But I no longer go in worried about whether I can do it or not. I don't want to lose sleep over it. I'm just, yeah, I'm just going to move all of this and then see what happens. I'm going to get rid of this first act. It's unnecessary. I'm going to move act two to act one. Right. You know, now what am I going to do? Yeah. Right. right. Wow. I love that. I love your enthusiasm just about those kinds of seemingly difficult aspects of screenwriting like what you just said makes it actually sound kind of exciting and like I want to just dive into a script and cut a bunch of stuff and move around now I mean it, it is, it is of, really exciting yeah you have like this infectious nature about you that is it's exciting to talk about writing you know what I mean so I like, love it I love human connection I love exploration of the human experience. I mean, whatever, my husband and I went to Les Mis last night, you know, and I cried like all throughout the first act. So I just love the idea. They have that great line, and I think it's from Victor Hugo, um, uh, to see love in another person's face is to see God. Mm. You know, so those sorts of moments coming through in literature, in performing and acting. I love actors. I love film actors. I love writing for people to act. Um, I love collaborating. We're working, I'm working with a great director on the Candy Darling piece. And I love when they throw things at me, you know, like, yeah, I'm absolutely willing to do that. And one of the things I was really proud of with the adaptation of the YA novel, uh, I'm good friends now with the author, I really deviated. Mm. Like my first vomit draft was very close to what the book was. Um, although the book was is apostolatory, so it did take some creative thinking, you know, because it was all journal entries and so forth. But I basically stuck with that plot that was in the book. And then there were lots of things that weren't working filmically for me. Yeah. And the story so evolved and changed and she loves it. And more importantly, her people and her reps love it and yeah. absolutely see it as a different entity than what the novel was, which I always feel if you really are going to adapt a book, it has to be something different because you'll never be as good as the book is at doing it, what the book is doing. Right. And especially um, when it's something like autobiographical or biographical, it tends to lean into the very positive aspects versus kind of diving into the stuff that we really want to get to, which is that pain and that what's in the cracks of somebody. Yes. So I think that, yeah, I think that's important. Yeah, that kind of dark soul of the night. Yeah. Um, uh, I was lucky in writing about Alan Carr because like she had a lot of problems, but I really admire, I really admire who he was. Um, and I was lucky in writing about Candy Darling too. I did an enormous amount of research, but there are so many things written about her from different people's perspectives and they all contradict each other. Right. That must be super difficult to figure out. Well, in some ways it's freeing because it's like, I can just sort of go with the one I like because what Holly Woodlawn said happens is not what Jackie Curtis said what happens, you know? So um, that was another situation where I could go to uh, darker places because there wasn't a definitive version of um, who she really was in those moments. Right. So I could look at every, and she wrote um, uh, a memoir too, which I read sort of cover. It's not a memoir. It's like a bizarre collection of recipes and uh, doodles that she made and like a uh, little monologue she would write. And actually the title of the film comes from a poem she wrote in that 
memoir. So I took a lot of who she was as a person coming through those, but there wasn't a story in what she wrote. So it had to be constructed right. while being faithful to who that person seems to be. Can you talk a little bit about your coming into ISA and and that diversity initiative um, contest um, and kind of, you know, how you feel about what ISA does in terms of helping writers? Oh, I'm blown out of the water. Blown out of the water. I'm just really now starting to get involved and look at what everything is. I was like really surprised to win the initiative. Oh, okay. Not well, because um, I feel I don't deserve something like that, but there's a lot of people who deserve stuff like that. And so who knows how all that comes together. And at some point it's a numbers game too. You know, and so I got the email and I was like, oh, okay, here's my rejection email, <laughs> you know, and I had to read it twice. Like, oh, wow, I won. That's really fantastic. I think too, because it was such a large scale film, I thought, ah, they're probably going to want like um, lower budget stuff. But I, you know, didn't let that stop me um, from submitting. And then that's when I really started looking at everything they have, I went to my first event to meet people and I loved the people I met. Um, I've started taking some of the um, classes. I've looked at some of the video classes about the business of screenwriting, which I think was fantastic. Um, they gave me like one free log line polish as part of the ISA. So I was like, all right, I'm going to do this. It was amazing. Oh, good. The log line I got back was like, I can't believe I, I would have never come up with this. It's terrific. So I am going to start sending in, you know, um, more stuff to be looked at. Uh, and I think it's a really supportive organization, you know, and it's it keeps you. It's also really informs you about what's going on in terms of where you can put your screenplays, uh, how to get them out and promote yourself. I had never made a, made a deck. Now I'm making decks because I was encouraged to, and they gave me, you know, the material, like, here's what a deck looks like. Here's what you should do. Because I would have just been like Googling, you know, deck. Um, Cause my nose has just been so to the ground in writing. Uh, I didn't look at that part of it yet. So yeah, yeah it's been fantastic. Yeah. And they just, um, asked me to look at some more of my scripts. So I'm super honored about that. And I'm sending those along. And I know also the strike's been going on this whole time. So I don't really know what else happens. I mean, I know it's the promotion that uh, um, they've done for writers. I haven't experienced any of that yet because I know that's all on hold for the strike, you know? As like my film and pre-production is on hold for the strike. So like we're all on hold for the strike, but I couldn't be like more proud of the union. Um, so I, I, I think it's a great organization. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so in terms of you, big picture for you, what is your, what's your dream scenario in terms of your career? Where do you want it to go? What are you looking to accomplish or or share with the world if it's something that's not, you know, like win an Oscar for your film, which always is up there, but you know. I, I want to get these stories out there. I want to be part of a community that is making films and getting stories out there. And I've been thinking about returning to directing hmm. as well. Um, so I, I wouldn't, my, I would like, I'm going to say it this way. I would like to be an auteur. Mm -hmm. I would like to be a queer auteur. Okay. I've already got half of it done. <laughs> <laughs> but. I like you. I dislike the word auteur. Okay. From my own, like, ugh, auteur. But I can see it from your perspective. So 
only because I feel like a tour makes the collaboration less, but I don't feel like that's where you're coming from. No, I agree with you completely. I hate the film by credit. It yeah. makes me so angry, like a Spike Lee joint when um, uh, Suzanne Laurie Parks wrote the script, you know? I mean, I love Spike Lee, but just anyone who does like, didn't write the screenplay, but takes that by credit. So all I meant was I'd like to write and direct like and threat. produce. Triple threat. Yes, I'd like to produce younger writers too. Yeah. yeah. But I'd be very happy just consistently screenwriting. Right. Okay. That would be the big dream. And if you're really gonna push the dream one inch further, maybe a little acting again, now and then. Like it? I, I was looking up actually the bio of one of the performers from Les Mis who was like, really impressed me last night. And she's like a queer playwright. And I was like, oh, that's fun. So like, She's got all these plays she's written and produced and she's just going into Les Mis for like, she's slumming at Les Mis for a few months. And I'm like, well, that would be, that would be cool, but I love writing. And what advice would you give to those younger um, creatives out there um, from, from your perspective? I can give two pieces of advice torn from my life. Do not let setbacks hold you back. Okay. Don't. Is there a story behind that? Well, there is. When my first film came out um, and it was scheduled to, it had US distribution in like a hundred plus theaters and it got some really great reviews. It premiered at Berlin, da da da. The New York Times review came out and it was scathing. It was so bad, people thought the critic knew me because they were like, this is so personal. How can he say all these like terrible things about you unless he knows who you are? And I was like, well, uh, they did. And I spiraled into depression, I gave up. I thought, well, Stephen Holden must know better than I do about what I can do. Um, that set me back a number of years. And maybe also with that, don't read reviews. Because <laughs> if you take the good reviews seriously, you also have to take the bad reviews seriously. You know, there are people you can trust who will tell you what they think. Um, so that's one, don't let the setbacks hold you back. And the other is keep writing. Do not coast on something that's happening. And that lesson came from my first option screenplay that went into pre-production and the whole time I stopped writing. Cause like, well now I'm gonna get an agent and I'm gonna get offers and I don't have to think of things. And then it fell apart for legal reasons. And I was like, man, I didn't do anything for the last year and a half, but watch this. So now I write all the time. I don't stop. Awesome. I love those two pieces of advice. Very, very good. Yeah. So um, trust me, don't do those things. <laughs> Thank you, Seth, for being part of our Emerging Screenwriter interview series. Oh, awesome. Great talking to you. Thank you.